Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Joining us today is Randy Barnett, the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at Georgetown University Law Center, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and the author of, among many other books, The Structure of Liberty, Justice and the Rule of Law, which recently got a new edition. The Structure of Liberty is a pretty comprehensive defense of libertarianism starting at the bottom and working its way up. And at that bottom, you have natural law. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Well, natural law is simply the regularity or order um, that's in the world that we live in. Uh, it's sort of based on the nature of the world we live in. It, it, it adheres to certain principles that are discoverable and which are discovered by many different disciplines. Um, um, medicine and agriculture and engineering are all discovering the natural law of their own disciplines. Um, and we don't have we don't think there's a big mystery and when we you know nobody asks a doctor or a person who's teaching medical principles well where where do you find those medical principles where are they uh, show me them no 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 it's not how it works and we don't say that to someone who's practicing agriculture uh, well are the principles of agriculture in the dirt no no they're not these so these principles uh, of regularity uh, that are discoverable uh, are the product of human minds um, they're not in nature itself but they're the way we comprehend nature because nature Nature is uh, – has regularities about it. And so uh, it turns out that uh, what's true of medicine and what's true of agriculture engineering uh, is also true of uh, how we structure society. This makes it less evanescent than a lot of people seem – when you talk about natural law, you get this sort of nonsense on stilts type of invocation, often seeming to have God involved and none of this seems to require God at no, all. The, the way God fits into the picture – I mean if you go back to Aquinas uh, and I like to do that because I don't think you can get anybody more Catholic than Thomas Aquinas. But I mean if you go back to Thomas Aquinas, he distinguished between three kinds of law. He, there was the human law. Uh, which was discoverable by uh, promulgation or publicization. There is the divine law, which was discoverable uh, by revelation. And then there's the natural law, which is discoverable by reason. And so if Aquinas can distinguish between divine law and natural law, I think it's OK for us to distinguish between divine law and natural law. Where God fits into the picture in the classic natural law writers like Locke and others is that uh, the natural law is based on the order that's found in the universe and their theory was that God was the source of that order. So God made an orderly universe and therefore God is the ultimate source of the order that we're discerning by reason. But these are not like divine commands, which is what actually was called the divine law. And, they, and that wouldn't change for physics, for example. They thought that the – Newton thought physics was based off of God's order and if you don't believe in God, you still believe right. in I mean, Newton. It, it, no, you know, it, no, it no more – um, uh, disqualifies or delegitimates political theories or political principles uh, that once it was thought that the order in the universe comes from God, then it would delegitimate medical theories or, or uh, theories of other uh, disciplines um, to think that as well. Now, the one thing – the one distinction I do make in the book, which I actually uh, got from George Smith and I got a lot of – I was heavily influenced by George Smith. Who uh, writes for the site uh, weekly. So right. That's and and uh, he and I – I should just parenthetically say that he and I lectured at the IHS summer seminars starting in 1982, I think it was, maybe 1981 actually. And uh, so we would listen to each – we weren't always at the same seminar but eventually we were and we would listen to each other's lectures. I think I listened to his lectures more than he listened to mine and I was greatly influenced by the lectures that he had. And I don't think I would have ever written The Structure of Liberty and I certainly don't think I would have reached the conclusions I did without having heard him speak. Um, but one of the distinctions that he made was between a descriptive discipline and a normative discipline. A descriptive discipline is like physics. Or you're just trying to figure out how stuff works. Um, a normative discipline is where you're trying to figure out how you ought to do something. Um, and a normative discipline, again, medicine. If you want to make people well or cure people or prevent them from getting sick, then you ought to do certain things. If you want to – agriculture, if you want to grow crops, then you ought to do certain things. These are all oughts. Uh, based on what the objective of the, of the discipline is. So a normative discipline is not the same thing as a descriptive discipline. So natural law um, uh, is typically uh, the, what governs these normative disciplines. And that's uh, – the if and then is very important in this because that's how you connect that ought out of there. You could just you say – You call it that a hypothetical imperative. Right, right. Well, it's, it's uh, given if then. 
um, um, it, it, this, logically, it is a hypothetical imperative if you adopt a Kantian way of looking at things. Um, but it's given the nature of human beings and the world in which we find ourselves. If you want to achieve a certain objective, then you had to go about it this way. And so, the, given the nature of human beings and the world we find ourselves is the world is the natural law inquiry, the inquiry into nature. If you want to achieve a certain objective, that will vary with the discipline. So if you want to make people well, if you want to grow crops, if you want to erect buildings, if you want to have a society in which people can pursue happiness uh, in uh, proximity to each other, then you had best respect these basic principles in order for that to happen. And so they all have the same logical structure. I was curious about that because you, you use these examples of, say, architecture. So if you want to build a building that's not going to fall down, then you have to follow these – Particular laws, or more specifically, given the particular yeah. laws of the universe, given, if you yeah. want to, given build the nature a, of yeah. the world, meaning given the fact that there's gravity and there's sure. mass and there's weight and there's this and there's that, then given all those things, if you want to build a building that will hold up, then you have to follow these principles of uh, engineering or architecture that we have discovered, and they're not perfect, and there's a matter of judgment as to how they're going to be implemented or not. But the, we don't question whether sure. they're uh, made up when. The, then the question I have is – so you say – you turn this into then something about political systems right. by saying given our nature as human beings and the nature of the world, if we want, you say, happiness, prosperity and peace, then we need to respect these libertarian principles. And I guess my question is we, we haven't had a state in the history of the world that respects the libertarian principles, especially at the really kind of rigorous level that you established them. But we seem to have done – I mean not always but often we do pretty OK when it comes to happiness, prosperity and peace. And so does that – is I guess the hypothetical imperative there maybe less imperative than the one for building a building that's not going to fall down? Um, it's a good question. And uh, first of all, let me say that uh, in the afterword of the new edition, I respond to many criticisms, one of which is the happiness, peace and prosperity formulation. Um, and I tend to concede in, if I had it to do over again, I would have just said happiness okay. because I think peace and prosperity are simply means or uh, things that you want in order to be happy. So happiness or, you know, is the ultimate uh, uh, end. Uh, and so there was a few things in the afterward I concede I would have changed if I had it to do over again. The other thing I would – I would, you know, maybe you're going to get to this later but the other thing I would have changed is I wouldn't have called private property several property. Well, that's I, the Hayek term, isn't it? I took it from yeah. Hayek. I liked the term. It meant something in terms of several separate all the individual and stuff. But it's just such a weird term that nobody gets that I, I should – I would have just bit the bullet and said private property and gone with it. So that's another thing I would have changed. But back to your question. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Um, to repeat the question, if those of you listening have lost the track of what it is, we seem to have you know better societies, worse societies. We do OK and there's no – they're by no means a libertarian society. Um, there's a couple of different aspects of this. First of all, what I'm arguing for I think is the core of classical liberal – classical liberalism and these are these core fundamental rights, uh, the five core fundamental rights that I talk about in the book. It's the right uh, of uh, property acquisition, the right to own and use property, the right to make contracts, uh, the right to um, – have restitution um, – to, to engage in self-defense and the right to uh, have restitution or compensation when your rights are violated. These are the five fundamental rights. Uh, they are the five fundamental rights of libertarian thought but they're also I believe the five fundamental rights of classical liberal thought. So to be a libertarian, I think the idea here is you try to work with just those rights and take just those rights as far as they can go without adding anything else. Now, that's kind of what makes a libertarian a libertarian and the more radical a libertarian you are, the more you just stick with those five rights and don't add anything else. At some point or another, people get off the bus and they're less radical. And classical liberals, I think, pretty much all agree on the core of these rights. Um, my view is that most societies that seem to be doing pretty well are basically respecting these rights. So they're not respecting them perfectly and that's why there's room for improvement. And I, I, as a libertarian, I think – as a classical liberal and then also as a libertarian and then also as a radical libertarian, I think we would do better. We would all be better off. We would be happier. We would be able to pursue happiness better if we protected these rights better than we do. But I think any society that ceases to protect them at all collapses. Almost as much as a building. And it seems right. too that that the buildings will fall immediately. But the way that these uh, – if you have a, a – uh, 
structural problem in the society, it tends to spin out of control well, it more slowly and add up to itself than the immediate collapse of the building. I would also say building. in the early part of the book when I used the building metaphor, I argue that a very well-constructed building, you actually can cheat a lot and steal from it and it won't fall immediately. You have a lot of redundancy built in, over-engineering built in and I say that for example, you can – you know, you could you could take a lot of uh, bricks and, uh, from the foundation and you can make a taller building out of it mm -hmm. but if you keep that up – Like playing Jenga. Yeah. Right. yeah, if you keep that up, it's not going to. It's not a sustainable. It's not a sustainable political theory to take bricks from the foundation and make a taller building. Mm -hmm. Sure. So maybe the closer analogy would be for to the the political to the political rules would be something like health or diet instead of building because building it's going to you know you build it wrong it's going to fall over. But health, we know eating certain ways are the best way to. They're going to improve your health, but if you don't do those, there's a lot more wiggle room there. I still think I like the building metaphor, and I think we actually know quite a we quite quite know a lot more about this than we do about our health principles, which change every year. Um, what was up was down. What was down was up. I mean, mm -hmm. you just wait along. You know, it's like the Woody Allen movie Sleeper. Sure, you yeah. get up, and and all I, the chocolate is good for you. Yeah, all the smoking fat food, smoking yeah. is going to be good for us. Uh, I mean, that's the one thing I probably think is not going to be good for us. <laughs> but almost everything else yeah. they said was bad is good. And the reason why the whole society is fat is because they've been eating what the nutritionist told them to. Um, so I think we know a lot more about this stuff. But I do think that if you really really fundamentally pull the props out from under these five rights, the society does collapse. It's the reason why war communism, so-called war communism, which was actually real communism, caused the mass starvation of millions and millions of people until the communists decided to reintroduce something like private property uh, into their agricultural system so that they could survive even though, of course, they didn't call it that. But that's what I'm, I'm saying is that every society that's functioning has been is respecting these principles to some degree or they just wouldn't be functioning. That's that's my answer. It's kind of non-falsifiable. Um, the, 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 the sort of the empirical test I offer for which society uh, is respecting these principles better than the others is to look and see which way the refugees are going, which way – which societies are having to build walls to keep people in and which societies are trying to keep people out. And that's sort of your empirical test of which society is better – doing better relative to other societies around. So uh, you, going back uh, to uh, the natural law, we'll go back to the sort of train of thought here. We do the given if then to establish how natural laws work. But that's not the same as natural right, correct? Right. And then you move on to talk about these are what natural rights would be. And so how, does, how do you get to well, natural rights? Well, natural rights is kind of the equivalent of the principles of medicine and the principles of architecture. So given the nature of human beings in the world, the whole formulation, the whole way of reasoning I call natural law reasoning. So it's all natural law reasoning. But the upshot of, the, of natural law reasoning as applied to a society in which you want people to be able to pursue happiness while living in close proximity to each other is the protection of these rights, which are natural rights. So the, that's the conclusion of your reasoning and of your natural law reasoning to reach the conclusion that these five fundamental natural rights re deserve to be protected, must be protected um, if you want a society in which people can pursue happiness. Trevor Burrus And you use that. You describe that in a way that I talk about too, the word jurisdiction in the sense of a zone of control. I, I often call it a zone of autonomy and, and having a zone to control for yourself. Help when, solve some problems, and that's and that's a lot of the heart of your book. When I wrote this book, uh, I started writing this book in the 1980s. I think it was, I think, or maybe the early 90s, whenever it was. It was while I was doing it. Grew, it was an outgrowth of my IHS lectures and my IHS uh, um, all, all these summer lectures I was giving. And when I wrote it, I adopted a lot of uh, alternate terminology in order to de to make this theory safe. Uh, for consumption from people who thought – didn't want to see anything crazy. So instead of liberty, I tended to use the word discretion. I don't use the I, – I only use the word libertarian once in the entire book in the beginning. I, something like no matter how libertarian one is, X. But that's the only time I used it. I called it classical liberal. Um, I used several property instead of private property. Jurisdiction, I, you know, sort of like with the – Property, you know, yeah. uh, Discretion. So I used a lot of other words to try to um, – uh, uh, get people to accept the substance of the analysis without being turned off by the rhetoric. 
since I wrote the book, the world has changed intellectually a great deal. Now, at the end, you know, I, I, for the new edition, I'm able to say on the on, in the dust jacket, this is a libertarian theory. I I, I say that uh, I say it in the afterword that this was a liber- This is always a libertarian theory. It is a libertarian theory now. Um, so, uh, you know, there's the, the modesty of libertarianism, which is – of radical libertarianism, which is what I'll be speaking at Cato uh, University about this summer and which is in the, uh, the book. Um, I'm able to, you know, take these words out and now really use them. You – the bulk of your book is taken up by how these principles we can derive from natural law – you remember, but I just want to make it clear to the reader: the only time I discuss natural law at all is in the opening, in the introdu- yeah. introduction. When I'm, and the reason I wrote that introduction is because the rest of the book is really not philosophical at all. Right. Only the first chapter is, and the reason why the first chapter had to be is because every time I would give this thesis, the first question anybody would ask me was, "Well, what are you talking about? Is this deontological? Is this consequential? Is this what? Blah 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 blah." So you had to situate it. So I had to situate it. I situated it as best I could. But remember, I'm not a philosopher. I don't claim to be. Um, I tried and I know enough about philosophy. I hope to keep myself out of trouble. That's that's what you need to know. It's like you not know enough law not to get yourself thrown in jail. So uh, that doesn't make you a lawyer, but that is useful. So I think I know enough philosophy from my training to not say something that's philosophically stupid. But I also don't claim to be one, and the book is not that philosophical after the first chapter. So what? I, and, and I'll say when I was a philosophy major, and my big influence. I've already mentioned George Smith. The other big influence who I credit in the uh, introdu- in the preface is my teacher uh, Henry Veach, who was a great Aristotelian Thomas natural law philosopher, and that's where I learned my natural law from when I was in college at Northwestern. Um, so what always frustrated me about listening to all this stuff about natural law theory is that everybody would talk about natural laws based on reason, natural laws based on reason, and then nobody would actually do the reason in order to tell you a conclusion. They were just debating about what it was but without telling you what it was. So this book is the that part. It's the putting the philosophy to one side, getting that out of the way, and now let's just engage in reason and figure out what these principles are. So it's the delivery of the output that what this book is about. Right. And, and so the bulk of the book is how do we address these three problems? Yes. Knowledge, interests, and power. Right. Um, so maybe let's start with knowledge. What is the problem of knowledge? Right. There's the three anyway? social problems that I claim every society has to address somehow. Um, and the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So you have to – I mean when you just state them abstractly, people go, really? You know, what, what, when you state natural you – know, you say the, um, the, na- the nature of human beings in the world in which we find each other. Everybody gets their hackles up and mm-hmm. they go, what do you mean the nature of human beings? What, what, kind, what kind of nature are you talking about? But uh, no, no, just, just cool out. Don't get excited. Just look at what I'm saying, the nature. The, 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 the aspects of nature I'm focusing on, I think they're self-evidently true. Try denying it. For example, you know – What's in your head? You listener know what you're thinking about right now. Nobody in the room with you knows what you're thinking. I certainly don't know what you're thinking right now. Um, and um, and that and you listener who's listening to this audio tape uh, or this podcast audio tape that's pretty <laughs> archaic um, who's listening to this podcast um, uh, would would not be able even if you tried to express everything that's in your head right now. Uh, only you know how you're feeling. Only you know when you're hungry. Only you know that sort of thing. This is just. Part of the human nature. You know it and we don't. Similarly, uh, the three of us sitting in this room understand what's going on in this room, but people outside this room can't hear us right now, including the engineer who mm-hmm. can't hear us because the, the audio system's defective. He can just see the needles moving. <laughs> this is very local knowledge. This is Within really room, local yes. knowledge. So we're all, we're sharing in this in this experience right now, but nobody outside this room is at this moment. You will you who are listening are sharing in it now in your own private space. But there are billions of people who don't have access to this knowledge. So. The problem of knowledge is how we make use of the fraction, this tiny, teeny fraction of knowledge that we have about our own situation and the situation that's local to us um, while somehow mysteriously, uh, magically taking into account all the knowledge everybody else has of which we are inevitably ignorant. So the problem of knowledge is also the problem of an infinitesimal spark of knowledge. I mean the uh, – like a molecule of knowledge in a huge Olympic swimming pool that's mm-hmm. vastly empty, which is our ignorance. And so there's got to be some way – if we're going to be happy, if we're going to pursue happiness, we've got to put into action what we know while taking into account what everybody else knows. It seems like when you put it that way, it's an insuperable problem. How could you possibly solve it except we solve it every day and we solve it by adhering to these fundamental principles. And that's – you keep that local control. You 
respect the rights and you give people the jurisdiction over the things they know about right. and, and help them disseminate that knowledge outward in the world via Hay the Hayekian price yes. uh, the it's system. Resource prices play a big role in the story and I obviously got this from Hayek. One of the things that I, I tried to do in this book and, and – uh, I was hoping that I was successful is I was trying to um, integrate into one framework a uh, lots of different theoretical approaches that people are attracted to that are not and are not mutually incompatible with each other but they somehow are speaking across purposes. So you start with the Hayekian problem of knowledge but then you move to the problem of interest which is the fact that our interests don't always blend um, uh, and we need a sufficient motivation in order to actually act on our knowledge. And the problem of interest is something that economists talk about in terms of incentives, incentives for example. Yeah. So that there, there comes in there and then you've got the problem of power uh, which is the third social problem and that's really basically an aggravated form of the problem of knowledge and the problem of interest. Once you decide that you need coercion or force to address the problems of interest because how you get people to adhere to the rules when they don't want to, you might have to coerce them. Once you introduce coercion into the picture by using force, then you have a new – you've introduced a new problem into the equation and that is problems of knowledge. That is when do you use force? knowledgeably, when are you correct to use it and problems of interest? How do you prevent the people who are authorized to use force from abusing it because of their interest? And that's how you end up with three social problems. So that's all pretty abstract. What would this look like? What does solving these problems look like in the real world as far as our political institutions or how we set up our society or state? Well, at the most obvious level, you have private property in which uh, you know, you just took a sip of that water and it's not my water. I've got a bottle of Mountain Dew. Everybody knows that's my favorite uh, uh, drink <laughs> and I have one of those. I bought it from a store. I exchanged stuff I had for stuff that they had and I, we both were better off as a result of that exchange and now I have that. I, you know, I have uh, – everybody knows what their stuff is. I mean I, when I try to demonstrate this uh, sort of instinctively in, in a room where I'm not wired up, I'll just gra you know, say, I reach over to grab somebody else's laptop and yeah. say, that's mine. And then, that's very jarring because it isn't. This person, it's really part of the other person's life. So private property at the most basic level is how we do it. And then I just already made a reference to freedom of contract where I exchanged um, uh, two dollars even at the CVS for this Diet Mountain Dew, twenty ounces, and um, and uh, I was made better off. CVS was made better off, and uh, I'm enjoying it right now. And so that's so that's concretely how we do it. It also and, seems like you're talking about very old ideas in the sense of. Madisonian you know, constitutional framers, Enlightenment era philosophers about how do you control power, how do you control interests, even with so with constitutions, theoretically those are also supposed to solve some of these problems too. Well, one of the things points I make, I think in the original book and I think also in the new afterward, and that is that um, classical liberals were the people who first really took the problem of power seriously. I mean every – and even today, there's a lot of people who don't take that seriously. They basically argue, well, here's the right answer. Let's make people do it. But wait a second. Once you empower people to make people do the right answer, then you've got a new problem. How are you going to deal with that? Oh, well, we'll deal with it somehow. They, you know, they whistle past the graveyard. They don't really try to address it. Classical liberals, uh, including our founders, um, did try to address it. They took this problem very seriously and they had a number of strategies for addressing it which were imperfectly institutionalized in our own governmental systems like for example checks and balances and separation of powers and um, other things and, and voting which establishes reciprocity between the ruled and the rulers. Um, uh, they, did, they, they saw the problem. They took it seriously. Most other competing ideologies today – uh, particularly those on the left, but also those on the right. And I mean, those are the, I talk about both in the afterward. I talk about the um, uh, legal moralism of the right today, and I talk about the um, what was the other phrase on the left? Um, Progressive. Uh, no, I mean, I can't even remember my own jargon. Here. Uh, I can't remember. I, I can't. This is embarrassing because I, I didn't reread the thing before I came into the <laughs> Modern studio. Modern progressivism. Now, well, it has to. It has to do with uh, redistribution on the left. But mm -hmm. I mean, progressive. What, I've, we should, somebody, you don't have a copy of the book with you? Not, not, not right now. Okay, well, you're going to have to get it up there on your on your Kindle. That's the problem. You need hard copy. You know, mm -hmm. Hard copy is much more easy to access than those things are. Look at him pushing buttons right there. <laughs> so uh, this is really embarrassing. Anyway, but uh, the idea here is that neither one of these. Views Views take seriously the power that their views require to be put into effect, where classical liberalism um, uh, does, I think, uh, take these into account. And how would you respond to? I mean, there's this sense that you're going to get of that's very simplistic and and 
simple-minded that doesn't truly deal with the problems of the world. Uh, you talk about freedom of contract. You don't deal with the problems of of uh, of exploitation and laborers and all these things. I mean that's going to be the, probably the main response you're going to get most of the time. And well, uh, There's a lot of responses of a lot of different issues. But, right. But how do we tre- treat those in general? Right. Well, first of all, the word simp- – the, the term simplistic is one of my pet peeve words. Uh, I used to hear it when I was younger. It's simplistic. Um, it's, an, it's a pejorative obviously but normally in other theoretical disciplines, ha- saying something is simple uh, is like saying it's elegant. It's saying something good about the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem with uh, – um, um, and and, and in, res- in general, in the abstract, in response to arguments that the world is so much more complicated and stuff, it's precisely because the world in its, real, in its reality is too complicated for us that we all engage in simplifying thought mechanisms in order to understand it. Understanding the world isn't translating the complexity of the world into an equally complex theory. If that's what it takes, you haven't really understood anything. Science doesn't work that way. None of these other disciplines work this way. It, they are all simplifying disciplines to abstract from the particular and yield oversimplified principles in order to act in the world. And if you just – if your theory was as complicated as the world was, there would be no need – your theory wouldn't do any good. You would be synonymous with the world in some basic sense. You would have to be as as complicated as exactly. So that's stupid actually. So it's a stupid – that part is a stupid criticism. Now – if the – criticism isn't that it's too simple but it doesn't take into account salient, important – factors that ought to be taken into account. That's a different matter and I do think that is what most people have in mind when they make this argument about too simple or simplistic. Uh, and then I would just have to say fine. Um, let's see how we – let's see you – know, tell me how we take them into account that doesn't undermine or take away from what I'm saying about the necessity of these five principles. Um, it, it's, it's not enough to say there's these other things out there. Uh, and actually, this is the other thing that I do talk about in the afterward, and that is that um, almost unless you're some kind of um, um, uh, radical, uh, I mean, like a, a true utopian communist, mm-hmm. which are there aren't total very, control, right? Unless, yeah. you're, unless you're one of those people, uh, by and large, all philosophies want to do is add stuff to the five basic rights. They don't want to take away the five basic rights, or at least they'll deny they do. But they want to add stuff to it. Well, adding stuff to it is obviously going to make it more difficult, more complicated. And and the question is, fine, you want to add something? Fine. Tell me how you add something without detracting from how we're solving these problems. Now, there may be a balance and this is the reason why class- classical liberals have a variety uh, – take a variety of approaches and that some get off the boat sooner than others. Again, this is a classical liberal defense of these five basic rights. It is not a repudiation of other things. It, is not, it, it does not purport to be a refutation of adding anything to it. Only it's trying to emphasize why these things are valuable and why the typical kind of argument you get primary, primarily from the left but you really also get both of these arguments from the left and the right and that is to say, well, because you need more than this, we have somehow refuted this. That's false. You haven't refuted this. You may argue you need more but then you're going to say how do you get more without taking away these things? These things are necessary. It's not an answer to my claim that these things are necessary to solve these pervasive social problems to say there are other social problems. You still have to tell me how we solve these social problems or deny these are social problems and I defy people to deny the social problems I identify are truly problems. And if they acknowledge their problems, they have to be solved and if this is the solution, now tell me how you add more to it without detracting from the solution. Would – how strong are these – like, so one of them is private property we've talked about. But how strict is the respect for private property that's needed to solve these problems? Because I can see you – know, would this prohibit even basic taxation because that would be you know, forcibly taking money from someone? As I said in the beginning, um, if that were true, this book doesn't make out that. It does not deliver that conclusion. This is a defense of the five basic rights that are at the core of classical liberalism. Libertarians, as I said before, um, try to get as far as they can on only those five rights and nothing else. And a radical libertarian says basically those are all there is unless you, maybe there's another version of radical libertarianism I'm not familiar with. But that, so to defend that, to defend that's all there is, you'd need more than what I produce in the book. I don't make that claim. I'm only claim. I'm making an affirmative case for these five rights, and then I'm making a claim that I just made again, uh, and that is that if you're going to say you need more and different and extra, you're going to have to explain to me how you get that stuff without undercutting the, what you need to solve 
these social problems. And so it's not that you can't answer I, – I can't – the analysis I present does not categorically exclude the possibility of answering that, of answering that question. But it does put the burden on those who – put forward these extra things to answer that question and that's a burden they don't want to accept. They typically just want to use their extra to refute the first principles and that's what I say is an illegitimate move on their part. One of the things that you talk about in the book that, that you do a very good job of is uh, compossibility, which is sort of one of the things that you're kind of getting at now. Can these systems of rights work together? If you add something, are you going to take something away from the five basic principles? And just to first fill in our listeners, um, the difference between positive and negative rights, which I don't think we've discussed yet on, on free thoughts uh, and how those are different types of claims, uh, uh, which you do a very good job of explaining the difference between the two types of claims. Well, I typically don't use the term – the distinction positive and negative liberty because um, negative sounds bad and positive sounds good and I don't think that the terminology ought to, pre pre to, ought to prejudice us one way or the other. So I think the more descriptive term is uh, liberty rights versus welfare rights. So liberty rights are freedom of action type rights and welfare rights are rights to stuff and of various kinds. And so – if you put it that way and you need liberty rights in order to solve social problems and you're going to add to it rights to stuff, well, the rights to stuff is going to have to come at a price. And you know, I agree that some societies handle this better than others but um, the question is do you really need rights to stuff uh, once you've gotten your liberty rights protected? And property rights are not rights to stuff. I think that's one of the key misunderstandings about property. Property rights are the rights to liberty within your jurisdiction. Now, there is boundaries and that's a physical thing but we say countries have boundaries. It's really no different than the kind of freedom or liberty that sovereigns are supposed to have within the – governmental sovereigns are supposed to have within the boundaries of their country that other sovereigns are not supposed to be interfering with. And I think – and this is actually something I've only been working on in the last few years. I think it's really better to think of each one of us as sovereigns over ourselves um, at the risk of sounding like these crazy sovereign citizen folks out in wherever they are. But I, they can't, we can't help it if they take good words and make them bad. But we are all sovereigns over themselves and that simply means like any other sovereign, we have jurisdiction over our domain and our domain is defined by private property. But what that's really defining is the extent of our liberty. So this is a liberty analysis as opposed to a stuff analysis. Once you have your liberty analysis more or less nailed down and that's not easy because we as lawyers know things get very complicated very quickly and uh, first principles will not resolve all legal problems. Can I tell an anecdote about okay, that? Sure, for please. A I mean I've learned this uh, the very first day I met Murray Rothbard. Uh, when I was a first-year law student, I came down to Fordham with my friend John Hagel and he introduced me to Murray and Leonard Liggio was giving a speech at Fordham and Murray was in the audience and we ultimately ended up in Murray's uh, living room. And I was just like thrilled because I read Murray when I was an undergraduate and he had this huge influence on me. I had written him this fan letter when I was going to law school. In fact, <laughs> that's how I hooked up with John Hagel because he knew John and he gave him a copy of my fan. He never answered me but he gave him a copy of my letter to him. To Murray gave John a copy of my letter and that's how he got hooked up and now John takes me down to New York and I meet Murray. We end up back in his living room. Now, I'm a first year, first semester law student and we've got all these crazy hypotheticals, especially in torch class that I'm having a hard time evaluating from a, as a libertarian. I'm a here. I'm a radical libertarian already. I should be able to have the answers to the questions and I wasn't coming up with them. So John and I started firing off hypotheticals at Murray and Murray – couldn't answer them either. He went, what? <laughs> and it's like he couldn't answer them. And this was quite a revelation. If Mr. Libertarian can't answer these questions any better than I can, well, maybe that tells us something about the limits of libertarian principles. And that is that they are very abstract. And they're abstract, I realized years later, for a reason. We derive them by abstracting from the particulars of social life to come up with these simple or simplistic principles. But because they're derived, uh, from abstractions from particularities. When the particularities are reintroduced in a real legal system, the principles are not always determinate with respect to how particularities are going to be handled. It's just an inevitable part of how you reach the principles in the first place. At that point, you need what I explained in the book is the rule of law. The subtitle of this book is Justice and the Rule of Law. At the time I wrote it, I felt libertarians 
uh, tended to elevate justice and give the rule of law a subordinate position. Conservatives, on the other hand, would elevate the rule of law and give justice a subordinate position, if any. I was arguing for why it's true that really first comes justice and then comes the rule of law. But operationally, the rule of law is as important to instantiating these principles as abstract principles are themselves. And that's when you need the rule of law to establish conventional rules that are um, not, acceptable within the they're basic acceptable framework, and they're not natural. They are they are not natural. The, the, the rules of contract law, which I teach as a contracts professor, are not natural law itself, but they're a way of implementing freedom of contract, which is the natural rights. Um, and 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 the law can vary from place to place over time, and depending on particularities in time, place, and circumstances, these rules can vary a lot and still be consistent with the natural rights, the fundamental natural rights. So the, the, one of the things you bring up uh, in a footnote in Structural Liberty is a reference to a Shower, Frederick Shower's Easy Cases, which is a very good law review article and something that is worth reminding people of, that the best rules solve all these cases or keep them from even coming to the point of needing a litig uh, some sort of adjudication. And those are really good rules that most of the time they solve 95, 98 percent of the problems and then you deal with really the ones far, on the end. Far more than that. I mean every little kid um, uh, who grows up with a, a backyard and a front yard understand, and they have neighboring kids understands mine and thine. They, in fact, that's the first thing kids say is mine, mine. And they know well, this is the line. This is the line. So it's true that at the line, there's some border time issues, and sometimes you don't get the line right. But within the within the within your yard, you really know what's yours, and we all kind of know what's ours. And those things just never get litigated. You might think you know billions and billions and billions of issues don't get litigated, and then there's a few thousand that do. You have a discussion in the book about punishment and restitution, um, and how we should handle enforcement, and then what we should do when people break these rules yes. and you end up coming to a conclusion yes. that's probably counterintuitive or at least sounds a little weird to most of our listeners, which is that we shouldn't we shouldn't have punishment, that all violations should be handled by restitution. Correct. Can you explain that a bit? Yeah, I came to this view um, when I was a law student. I wrote a paper called Restitution of Victims uh, – a uh, Restitution, a New Paradigm of Criminal Justice, which I wrote as a Harvard Law student for my third year writing requirement. I wrote it with an uh, IHS summer a grant um, uh, and uh, it was um, an interesting project. Uh, it ended up being published in Ethics, uh, which is the premier philosophy journal published by the yeah, University of Chicago that's Press. Great. So it was a law student article. It got published in Ethics. It did not get an A, however. It got a, <laughs> it got a B plus, which at Harvard Law School is a pretty bad grade, actually. So um, it was, it, but it would never. And it actually got published in pretty much the form it was turned in on. It didn't get Ethics didn't edit that much. So. Um, <laughs> And, and so I staked out this territory um, uh, when I did that and – but I modified the – I supplemented the position by the time the book was written. And so I pushed very hard and this was one of the most controversial things I've ever had to defend over the years, uh, which is why restitution should be the predominant uh, form of response to criminal conduct and not punishment. So first of all, let me say what I mean by that and then I'll say how I supplemented it. Uh, what I mean by that is that we should not be – uh, dealing with criminals on the basis of their badness. I think criminals are bad. I mean I was a criminal prosecutor for four years. I met a lot of criminals. Some of them are really bad. Some of them are not that bad some, but some of them are really bad. There's variations. Among, just because you're a criminal doesn't really make you that bad but there are really, really bad ones. Um, but that's not what we should be judging. We should be, we, 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 what we should be doing is we should be judging what they've done as opposed to how bad they are. How badly did they hurt somebody? How, bad, how badly did they violate the rights of others? And then we should focus on making them make it up to um, their victims. And that should be the primary focus of the criminal justice system, making them make it up to their victims. And that would probably mean in most cases making them work to pay off their victims, uh, the debts they owe to their victims. Um, and um, that's you know the 13th Amendment, which prohibits involuntary servitude, makes a specific exemption for punishments for crime. Uh, so that is OK. It's constitutional. All right. That's where I, I – that was the paradigm I developed. By the time I wrote the book, um, I had supplemented that paradigm and uh, this was something that again happened in, in sort of lecturing at summer at IHS with George around and uh, essentially what I developed was the, the idea that 
what we what what bo- one of the things that bothers us about that is the fact that there are dangerous people out there, and what about them? And I actually think the problem of dangerous people is not a problem of punishment; it's a problem of prevent. It's a problem of self defense. So you have a the fifth you know the fifth right is the right of self of restitution for violations of your uh, of your rights, which is violated every day of the week because. Criminal justice system does not make restitution of victims. That's not why it's organized. It's organized around punishing the bejesus out of people. Um, but the fourth right I defend is the right of self-defense. And what I think of with I think of dangerous people is I think that we are entitled to use self-defense against people before they actually strike a blow against us. You, everybody understands that intuitively. You don't actually have to wait for someone to pull the trigger before you can defend yourself against somebody who's drawn a gun on you. Well, I think it can happen. That people by their prior conduct can make themselves out to be a standing threat to other people. And so it is not so much – and in some respects, here's where in some respects their badness comes back in. If they really are bad people, if, if, if hurting other people has become what Aristotle would call second nature to them, um, then they're really dangerous and they, they need to be segregated from us. So we would hold them separately. Uh, apart from their duty to make restitution, not because we're punishing them for their badness, but because we're protecting us for them from them, and that's why uh, transportation of criminals uh, from England to Australia made sense. It's why transport- transporting them to Georgia makes sense. We can't transport criminals anymore, so we put them into penitentiaries uh, where we separate them from the general community. And as a result of having done that a lot in the last two or three decades, crime rates have really gone down because the ones that are the most dangerous aren't with us anymore. They're committing crimes against each other in the penitentiary, but they're not committing crimes against us as long as they're in there. I don't view that as punishment. Punishment is making them suffer, making them pay. Now, let me just say this. As a human being, I believe in punishment. I have a retributive streak like everybody else. I was a prosecutor. It sort of helped me motivate me and it doesn't bother me at all when I see bad people get their just desserts. But it's authorizing the state to issue those judgments that I have a problem with. Um, Much as it satisfies me, like it satisfies others to see it done, um, I'm not sure I trust the state to do it. I think it's enough if the state would protect the rights of us by making these folks make restitution to victims and putting them someplace where they're not going to harm us if they have proven by their conduct that they are a standing threat to the community. To address potentially one objection I can imagine people having, when you talk about self-defense, that's outsourceable. So you're not you're not saying I actually need to yes. be wandering around with a weapon to defend myself, but I could have a police force, whether private or not. Right. The, the, way, the, the way the law is written, the way the positive law is written today is is you have a right of defense of self and others. That's just it's the defense of self and others is and there's the defense of self, others, and property. But there's, there's different rules governing all. But the defense of self and others is a, is a well recognized one. I think that the good thing about your viewpoint when I try to explain people restitution. It's, it refocuses the question about on the odd issue of you know, why do we pay someone when we when we have a fender bender we pay them or their or their insurance our insurance company pays them, but when we do other types of crimes like sh- maybe shoplifting or something of a criminal nature we pay the state. Uh, you know that 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 is a weird thing which you refocus on to saying we harmed the shopkeeper too and you know there's a fine that we give to the court if we get caught but why don't we give that to the shopkeeper at least for the first I mean that makes much more sense. Correct? Well, in most cultures um, uh, throughout history, they, they've been dominated by compensation uh, um, or what the, they used to call the vergilt in uh, Europe, in medieval world. Medieval systems and all tribal systems that don't have centralized governments are compensatory in nature. Now, sometimes it's individual compensation. Sometimes it's cl- group compensation. Pro- you compensate the clan uh, of, the, who, of which the, per- com- the person's a member. But it's very compensatory. Um, uh, what in middle, medie- medieval Europe they had the ver guilt, which was the compensation you owed for committing a crime, um, and then if you turned out to be dangerous, what happens is if the communities ended up having to pony up for your for your crime because they would have to pay the other clan, then they would have an interest in policing you. And if you turned out to be a repeat offender, what did they do? They kicked you out and they made you an outlaw. The term outlaw meant outside the protection of the law. They didn't actually kill you and they didn't actually punish you. But once you were made an outlaw and they withdrew their protection from you, anyone else who wanted to kill you and punish you could do so with impunity and that was a really tough spot to be in. So by withdrawing protection, you end up, quote, punishing, unquote, people without directly punishing them. So 
It was only with the creation of the centralized state that you then – or the rise of the kingship actually. When the king started intervening, the monarch started intervening in this local tribal system, which the people were very reticent about giving up. They were very reluctant to give up their rights to compensation. But eventually the king superseded them and then the king's – breaching the king's peace turned out to be the major offense. And it's sort of the way it is today. It's, a crime against society is not a crime against you. So it turns out if, if, you, are, if you are raped and you are uh, assaulted, you have not – you are not the official victim of the crime in our legal the system. The state is. The, the people of the state – I represented as a prosecutor the people of the state of Illinois and I didn't represent you. I represented the people. So, you, so what happened to you is simply a crime against, some, against the, the polity and not against you at all. Well, I think that's perverse and if people are – Actually, if that perversity is expressed, then people go they – they, they would rebel against it because that doesn't sound right to them. I'm curious how we distinguish dealing with bad people, so preventative, from punishment, um, I guess along two lines. The first is that the concerns you raised about why you know, we, we all we, – most of us feel like punishment can be morally justified, but we don't want to give the state that power because there are concerns would also seem to apply to – Preventing bad people from doing things, you know, because there's still these judgment calls, and we have to lock people away. And then, similarly, the the punishment that we often inflict upon people who are convicted of criminal acts looks very much like protecting us from bad stuff. You know, we don't we don't tend to. I mean, there's the death penalty, but outside of that, the what we do is we lock these people away, and that's their punishment and protecting us from bad people. So do the two – do they collapse into each other? Well, first of all, in terms of giving people their just desserts and their uh, – that's a much bigger issue than simply people who commit crimes. There's all kinds of bad people out there. Some commit crimes, some don't. I like them all to see – I like to see them all get their just desserts. Most people do and yet we still don't authorize the state to pass out rewards and punishments to generally people. Well, if, if that's a good idea, let's just do that. Let's just make all the good – give all the good people a check in that morning and, and a pat on the back and all the bad people, we're going to put, send them away. I mean I know a lot of bad people who don't commit crimes. So the problem of, des of just desserts is much bigger than the criminal justice system I and mean, we don't allow the state to do it. Um, so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you're right. There are serious practical problems with figuring out who would be the dangerous ones it's, or even who deserves restitution and how much restitution they should get. And in fact, the whole amount of dollar – putting a dollar amount on this is arbitrary to begin with. There's no natural – correlation between a particular sum of money and a particular injury that you've suffered. We're just basically saying making you better off is better than not making you better off. And then there's a question of how much better off we do it. These are questions that again have to be handled by conventional rules that are not perfect and they are not derivable logically from the fundamental principles. They're just the way we put them into effect. The one I would think is makes the most sense in the case of dangerousness is prior criminal either prior criminality which would – a track record, which is what generally speaking happens before anybody gets sent to the penitentiary. They've committed dozens of crimes, dozens of crimes without getting caught, several many crimes before they get – anything happens to them, oftentimes as juveniles where they never get put in, in – incarcerated. So they're basically trained to be criminals before they ever get put behind bars. So you have a track record. I would go by a track record and or uh, these very unusual criminals who really – are sociopathic and they just get off on violating other people's rights. This gives them affirmative satisfaction. Those that small subset of all criminals who the criminals are afraid of and um, those are the people you'd have to judge by the kind of crime they committed. I mean it would have to be one of these super heinous crimes that you go, oh my god. I mean these people are defining themselves as dangerous to the community. You ask yourself why did they do that and if they did it because it gave them satisfaction. Well, let me just tell you something. We don't want that person running loose. Well, we're almost out of time um, but I think we've gone on a bunch of different switchbacks and talked about a bunch of different things. But going back to the, the five core rights and the kind of society that this can create uh, that maybe we're going against. Um, so what, what do you see this in terms of the hope? Is there hope now to, that we could reinstate these? Are people going to have more hope? Or are these rights a bygone era that we, we rescued in the Enlightenment and then used and now are going away? Well, going back to the opening conversation, I think that if we're – if any society is functioning, is respecting these rights. We're currently respecting them. To others, some degree or another. To some degree or another and it's better and worse. It's not all or nothing. It's better and worse. As soon as you stop respecting them, you reach a critical mass of not respecting them, then the society collapses. But – 
if we're not collapsed, it means we're respecting them. And that's true even of communist countries. Uh, they're respecting them too. But there's better and worse. And so what we're fighting to do is make it better rather than worse. And that's and so that's what Cato and public policy institutions are trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do as a lawyer, make it better as opposed to worse. So we're moving on a scale. And then when it comes to libertarians, radical libertarian positions versus other classical liberals, um, it's a question of how far can you push the paradigm before you before it breaks down. We, we really haven't tried pushing the libertarian paradigm all the way. Um, my guess is that if we were ever to try it, it would it would be a naturally a gradual process. You just not, you're not going to push a button one day and suddenly have a libertarian society. The libertarian society is somewhat of a model against which to judge existing societies. And then as you move in that direction, if it turns out our theory isn't so good as we thought it was and problems arise that we didn't anticipate. There's, the, there's more than enough time to modify our theory. But in the meantime, we try to push forward in protecting these five basic rights just as best as we possibly can. At the very beginning, we mentioned that a second edition, a new edition of The Structure of Liberty has just been released. So maybe in closing, can you sell us on that second edition for those of us who perhaps have the first edition? Is there – What's changed and why should we buy another Well, here's copy? where I should have read the afterword before I came over here. I mean the number one thing I did is I um, um, added a reply to critics. I mean there were some excellent criticisms made of the book, uh, some from the left and some from the right and some from libertarians that I took pains to respond to in the beginning of this uh, afterword. And the other thing I did was I tried to situate uh, – so that's important I think. Uh, and then the other thing uh, is sort of a new thing uh, that was added to it and that is this modesty of, liber of radical libertarianism and that is the idea that even though we are thought to be radical, we are actually – our claims are more modest than our, uh, our, our, our ideological competitors because on the left, they want to see that everybody gets the right amount of stuff superimposed purportedly on the protection of these five fundamental rights and, see, and creating a mechanism by which everybody gets the right amount of stuff is really hard to do and it not only does it undermine the five rights, it's actually just a hard thing to do generally. So they want to make things more complicated and worse, I mean in, in, and more challenging. On the right, they want to make sure that everybody uh, does the right thing with their liberty. So on the left, they, they're concerned about stuff. On the, and by the way, that, that, this left-right thing, there's people on the left that want to do both and there's people on the right who want to do both. But on the right, they're preoccupied with everybody doing the right thing. Well, how are you going to figure that out? Who's going to be empowered to make everybody do the right thing? You got to, you know, you know, consume the right stuff and not consume other stuff and have sex with the right people. I mean, they're very preoccupied with this. Well, this all adds more uh, difficulty to the five basic rights. So we're saying is we're just sticking with the five basic rights. They want to add more to what we're doing, and that makes their positions more radical than our positions are. Our position is more modest. Let's just stick with these and see how far this takes us. They want to add more stuff. And that whole analysis is at the in the in the afterword. That wasn't in the original book. That's in the afterword. And there's one other thing that I defend in the afterword, and that is why bother one of the things you didn't ask me about is the part of the book in which I talk about a polycentric legal order in which there is no government uh, as we know it to provide law and order and why think about stuff like that. And I say the reason – I defend that way of thinking and uh, uh, why it's useful to think about that stuff is because – um, arguing uh, against um, a polycentric legal order or arguing – one way, argument against liberty is that if we take your principles to their logical conclusion, then there will be no government and therefore there will be chaos and therefore that's a reason for – from uh, that's offered an objection to making the first step in the direction of liberty. If you actually have the model of no government or no government law enforcement, no government provided law enforcement as not such a bad place to be. If we ever got there, it would actually probably not be so bad. In fact, it might be better. Then that deprives the other side of a reductio ad absurdum argument against us. Therefore, they're, they're deprived of the argument for why we can't take any steps in the direction of liberty because to take any steps, the logical conclusion of which is to lead to X. X is not such a bad place. Now we can take some steps. So it's, I think this is useful to think about not because we're ever going to get it in our life because, but it, because it deprives our opponents of a potent objection they like to make against us in which what George Smith called the specter of anarchy, that if they can haunt you with the specter of anarchy, then you'll shrink from your basic principles and admit that they have to be compromised. And I don't think we need to make that admission. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P-O-D. 
Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.